Um, so what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about some of the fish-related work that uh, follows up on Deepwater Horizon and some of the other work that my lab is doing. Uh, just to say, um, that really looks like the expression that Jack Nicholson had in the movie The Shining. <laughs> um, so these are all uh, either graduate students of mine or um, close, close enough. Right? So, um, so what I want to do is uh, kind of give you a potpourri of fish-related studies. Uh, first of all, to follow up a little bit with uh, the introduction Dave gave on uh, our deep water horizon work and, and really talk a little bit about uh, um, the, the higher trophic levels. By the way, fish don't blink, but they are important. <laughs> uh, secondly, talking, uh, switch gears in to totally and talk about the development of new methods for assessing fish populations. And this is the work that uh, we've been doing with the Center for Ocean Technology on the development of uh, toad, sis, toad video systems for counting fish. Um, third, uh, NSF grant that I've got uh, looking at the dynamical behavior of fish and fishermen. And then last, uh, I'd like to talk about a couple of public service activities that uh, our lab and, and, and I have been and undertaking. So I'm going to skip the uh, introduction part of, uh, of uh, that, uh, the sea image thing, and talk a little bit about, again, the fish work. Most of our fish work um, for Deepwater Horizon has been done using longline fishing gear, right? So this is a long line going out. Uh, generally, we set out five miles of long line gear with 500 baited hooks. Uh, over the past four years, um, we've uh, done about 200 long lining stations in the northern Gulf, which have resulted in about 10,000 fish being caught. So uh, we're a fish killing machine. Uh, <laughs> You know, we don't kill them all, but you know, uh, nevertheless. So here's here's the, the group uh, out on the weather bird, um, basically doing some sampling. So, so early uh, on when I came here in 2011, this was just post Deepwater Horizon, and fishermen were talking a lot about the um, you know these uh, fish with these kinds of skin lesions coming up, and uh, so Bill Hogarth and I uh, were able to wrangle some money out of nymphs to go take a scientific look at this because obviously. You know, if you've got, you know, one fisherman posting a picture on Facebook, you know, all of a sudden it becomes like a million fish, right? So, uh, so we wanted to do a little bit more systematic work in looking at the, the uh, frequency of skin lesions on, on fishes. And so this is sort of a rogue gallery of, of some of the fish that we collected, up in, uh, particularly up in the northern Gulf. But originally, you know, we didn't know what the spatial extent of this uh, was. So we, we actually worked from the dry tortugas all the way up to sort of mid-Louisiana to try to understand the spatial scope of this as well. So long story short, um, we recently published this paper in the Transactions of the American Fishery Society on the prevalence of external fish lesions and uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in Gulf of Mexico fishes. And um, the, the nexus of this is primarily the comparison between two years in terms of the, the frequency, the percent frequency in skin lesions, um, 2011 versus uh, sampling we did in 2012. Subsequent to the publishing this paper, we've also worked in 13 and 14, and what's happened is the frequency of these skin lesions is going down and down. Now, interestingly, when we um, uh, published this paper, the USF had a press release, and you can see the, the quote was, you know, skin lesions and oil residue have declined in years following the Deepwater Horizon. And of course, when the media gets that, uh, it's uh, research shows Gulf of Mexico oil spill caused the lesions, in the, and that is not what we said. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, uh, this paper paper's really got a lot of circulation. As of this morning, it had been downloaded 1,204 times, which makes it the most downloaded paper in the history of transactions in the American Fisheries Society. Of course, I mean, it's, you know, it's a short time series relative to, you know, because... You know. So anyway, our work has kind of concentrated on three important species, and this is uh, uh, Susan Snyder, and this is uh, Liz Herder. Um, we really looked at three different species with three different life histories, uh, red snapper, uh, tilefish, and king snake eel. That's a particularly large specimen, uh, average-sized woman, right? Uh, uh, um, so, so, so you can see, you can see that um, uh, the places where we caught um, king snake eel are, are primarily around the edge of the river. Uh, they, they occur in muddy sediments. Uh, the tilefish, um, they occur throughout the Gulf of Mexico, but primarily up in the apex of the, uh, of the uh, DeSoto Canyon, and red snapper are more of a shallow water species. And so um, uh, the work that, um, that Susan's done is indicated, so this is a uh, naphthalene equivalence in the bile of, of um, the three different species. This is um, tilefish, red snapper, and uh, king snake eel. And this is um, 
uh, benzoapyrene equivalents. Of course, as, as David said, this is a petrogenic, uh, a pyrogenic uh, PAH. And so these are some of the previous studies that have gone on in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see that tilefish in particular are uh, heavily contaminated with the uh, petrogenic PAH metabolites, not so much the pyrogenic PAH uh, metabolites. And if you actually list these uh, in terms of global studies, the tilefish is actually ranks among the highest uh, contaminated species uh, uh, seen. And so some of our work is going to continue on to see, you know, if in fact um, this is an ephemeral event or if in fact uh, because uh, tilefish are bioturbating these sediments that they continue to uh, self-contaminate themselves. And some of the work that we're going to continue to do not only is looking at bile but also the other constituents uh, in, in muscle and liver, et cetera. So um, what the study that, um, that Liz Herter uh, just completed for her master's studies looked at the uh, population dynamics of, um, in particular, red snapper, and she's focusing on growth rates and age composition. And you see a really interesting trend. Of course, you know, we caught red snapper throughout the, this northern Gulf exit, uh, um, uh, crescent here. And you can see that this is the age composition from age 2 to 10 plus in 2011, 12, and 13 samples. She's just completed the 14 samples, and, and I think, Liz, are you here? Yeah, okay. I think, um, she's, I think she told me that the eights were dominant in 2014. So th it's really shifting over in terms of, you know, like a baby boom generation going on here. The, the issue, of course, is that we're seeing very, very few recruits post Deepwater Horizon in red snapper, which, you know, red snapper is a really important commercial and recreational species. And so the dearth of recruits is actually meant that the, uh, the growth in that population has actually subsided and it's, it's basically tapered off which has important implications for the fisheries management. And so, so we're going to continue on with these kinds of studies as well. Uh, we can't say that this is deep water horizon related, just like the, the, uh, the skin lesions, but it's awfully suspicious, particularly since um, if one looks in the western Gulf of Mexico, um, it's continuing with high levels of recruitment, you know, and so, so something, you know, uh, the separation between the west and east stocks is really the river, and so, uh, so something suspicious is going on. Um, this is some uh, work that uh, my student Jacqueline Hypes is uh, going to defend on January 22nd, right? So Jack, so early on in 2012, I think uh, Christina and uh, and Amy and I were out, and we we came across this population of these really cool-looking black sharks. They're about a meter long, maximum size, um, very deep water, somewhere between 600 and 1,200 feet deep, um, and we couldn't figure out actually what they were. And this is actually part of Jacqueline's work is actually try to figure out what species we were looking at, which is um, the gul th these are the so-called gulper sharks. And uh, so we think that this is a species called little, shark little gulper. Um, uh, co combining data that, that we had with the deep sea uh, data, we can see that the population is primarily centered along the northern apex of, uh, of the DeSoto Canyon. The cool thing about these things is we, we've um, actually sampled uh, hundreds of these things, probably about 800. And you can see that if you look at the uh, size composition of the males versus the females, the, the males top out at a smaller size uh, than the females. It's very typical of sharks, and in particular dogfish sharks. Right? And, so, um, so, um, and you can see that they go down to around uh, just about 40 centimeters. And when we were up here um, working on these things, the pups were actually dropping out at about 40 centimeters. So that's actually you know, uh, in being sort of spontaneously aborted. And so, so this is really the size at which they come out of their mothers. And when you think about it, um, can you imagine if um, you know, human babies came out at a third of the weight of their uh, parents? I mean, that would be a massive. <laughs> Anyway, so, so, so Jacqueline is continuing on with the population dynamics work of this. And uh, one of the really cool things about this and the other dogfish is, is this is the sex ratio between males and females. And you can see that in the uh, smaller sizes, it's about one to one. But then you get this sort of characteristic drop in the ratio uh, of females to males, which reflects the accumulation of the, the males at their terminal sizes. And then it reverses because basically you run out of the, the smaller males. And the, the reason the, the males are smaller is they don't need the body cavity size in order to drop these big you know, babies out, right? And so, 
So you get this characteristic notch. Now the cool thing about this notch is that um, it's, it's a reflection of the, uh, the ratio of, this, uh, of the um, animals, but also their relative abundance. And so one can simulate different things about the, using different growth parameters, et cetera, to actually see if you can replicate this, this, um, this, this notch behavior. And I think with a combination of different growth parameters and mortality rates, um, she's been able to figure out what's a likely um, life history for this animal without having aged animal one, which is kind of cool. Um, so I actually recommend you come to Jacqueline's thesis defense. So uh, another study that um, uh, one of my students, Emily Chancellor, has been working on is the um, potential for the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill, and this is the surface expression uh, data from NOAA, uh, to interact with ichthyoplankton populations, that is uh, larval fish. So um, there's a really cool data set that goes back to 1982, and this is a, a NOAA-related data set, and it's uh, basically uh, uh, bongo samples and Newston samples have been done throughout this grid since 1982. So um, looking at the intersection between, you know, where the surface oil was, and where you know different species larvae was, that can give you some sort of indication of the potential impact on different species, depending on if their larvae were primarily distributed up here or someplace else in the Gulf. And as part of this study, um, David talked a little bit about the work of Claire Paris. Uh, Claire has run models to look at what an oil spill would look like if it happened here, and what it, it would look like if it happened here in terms of the surface expression of the oil, we can go back and look at the larval data set to see what the intersection and potential species ramifications would be for different spills. Now, our, you know, our colleagues who are uh, working on oil spill preparedness, this would be a really cool thing to have, actually, you know, uh, understanding what the, the species at risk would be for an oil spill anywhere in the Gulf. So, so these are um, some of the data um, that uh, Emily will defend on later in the spring. And you can see that these are a, a variety of different species, sort of the top 10 list of, of, of the potential. Um, things like the silver anchovy, about 40% of all the larvae that we ever caught in the Gulf of Mexico were within the hull of the deep water horizon. So clearly things like um, speckled trout and silver anchovy and striped codlet, um, very uh, pot potential for a, a great deal of impact. Now, other species that have been published on in terms of uh, you know, uh, economic species like bluefin tuna, about 15% of their distribution, Spanish mackerel, et cetera. So um, the, the cool thing about this is that you've got a lot of economically and recreationally important species like, like speckled trout and sand sea trout, bluefin tuna, but you've also got these other things which are primarily deep water species. So this uh, basically implies that um, it's not only the impact on the species by species basis, but potentially the underlying ecosystem that's supporting a whole variety of other resources. Now, um, in terms of um, the other spills, so what we did was we simulated what, you know, what would happen for a spill that would be on the West Florida shelf uh, at 27 degrees latitude that would run for the same length of time as the Deepwater Horizon uh, starting at the same start date, which was April 20th, right? So these are basically the, um, the uh, uh, particle trajectories that come from this simulation over an 80-day period. And so you can see some really interesting behavior. Obviously, you get this uh, ejection of oil spill particles um, on the West Florida shelf um, up to um, up, to, up along the Atlantic coast, but you also get this bifurcation, right, which, um, you know, basically the oil getting caught in an eddy and actually, you know, being self-contained within the Gulf. So, so the point here is that uh, Emily's work is going to take that ichthyoplankton data set and look at the intersection between what species there are and, you know, what potential is at risk, and it's going to be a dramatically different, you know, species composition. So same thing for a spill in the Western Gulf. This is the, the Western Gulf spill. Very little interaction uh, with the eastern side of the Gulf, and it's, these are much calmer waters, obviously. But the important thing is, you know, this is the U.S.-Mexican border right here, and so you can see that there's a potential for some significant cross-border interaction. So, so it's, this will be a really interesting thesis when it's completed, and it's going to really have some ramifications for oil spill planning. Um, so, uh, yeah, as I said before, you know, most of our work so far has been concentrated at, uh, in this uh, crescent here. Uh, but a lot of the, speci uh, the, the species that we're concentrating on in terms of uh, red snapper, tilefish, and king snake eel, they actually occur all the way around the Gulf. 
And so as, um, as David said, you know, in terms of looking at the coring sampling, uh, one of the things that we're going to do under the new CMH2 grant is actually extend the long line sampling to the entirety of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and so we've got a, a, um, a transect design. Um, and we're hoping, hoping to use the Weatherbird 2 to basically sample in all of these areas. Now, this will give us, number one, uh, really valuable baselines that we can compare the northern Gulf of Mexico contaminant levels, uh, frequency of skin lesions, but also, you know, some basic biology like the genomics of red snapper and the genomics of tilefish and other things. And so, um, uh, and this kind of um, complete sampling scheme for the Gulf of Mexico has never been done before. So we think we're going to have basically a tissue archive that potentially, you know, down the road can be used for all sorts of different investigations. And so we're really kind of thrilled uh, with the idea of being able to do this. Logistically, it's going to be a difficult enterprise. It's not as far as you think, you know, in terms of actually getting the weather bird. It's the same distance from here to, to the top of Campeche Bank as it is from Tampa to um, the Deepwater Horizon site, which is about 48 hours uh, trip. Um, there are obviously a lot of uh, complicated logistics for us to be working down there, but nevertheless, our Mexican partners, I think, are going to make this happen. Um, I wanted to switch gears totally and talk about the second uh, set of issues that I've, I've gotten, second set of uh, grants. And this is um, um, back a couple of years ago, we um, got a, uh, two grants from NOAA to work on this problem of uh, assessing um, fishes in untrawlable habitats. Now, trawling is kind of the method uh, of choice that's used for fishery independent sampling, not only in the United States, but around the world. But when you think about these hard carbonate reefs that we've got out on the West Florida Shelf and other places, they are not amenable to trawling. I mean, you just can't do it. Um, you, know, you can do it maybe once, but uh, you, you don't have a net and you don't have a reef, right? So, so the point here is that, you know, can we actually develop a towed camera system? Is the visibility of the water sufficient? Do you scare away too many fish? To actually come up with um, calibrated biomass estimates for the different reef uh, species that are not easily sampleable, you know, with the traditional gear. And so um, in partnership with the COT folks and Chad and Steve, Alex, Gino, and, and Mike, uh, we put together a... Um, a, a towed camera system called CBAS, which is the Camera Based Survey Assessment System. Uh, and we've been testing this out in a variety of areas. And uh, our, our uh, uh, testing areas have been these three um, marine protected areas on the West Florida Shelf and as well this, uh, the marine gas pipeline. And the reason the gas pipeline is has been important for testing is it's a really nice physical feature. We can get on it. We can stay on it. It's got a lot of fish on it. It's easy to see and it's easy to track. And so a lot of the original development work has been along the pipeline, uh, but as part of Sarah Grasti's thesis, we've actually estimated the biomass of um, different reef fish species in the Madison Swanson. This is a full-on marine protected area and the uh, uh, Florida Middle Grounds, which is um, a habitat area of particular concern, which means some activities are prohibited, but it's not a MPA in the sense that fishing is prohibited. You know, and that'll become apparent to you in a minute. Um, so this is Chad flying sea bass. Um, it's basically a system where um, there's uh, real-time control of how close to the bottom you get. Uh, an image comes up. Um, you get all the sensor data. You can fly it. Uh, the, the, the point of it is trying to fly it two or three meters above the bottom so you can see the bottom features and count the fish. Um, using their real-time GIS maps, in, in particular Dave Nars, uh, really exceptional um, GIS maps of the, the three closed areas, which are absolutely critical for flying this thing without flying into a ledge or some other thing. Um, and then also using real-time um, uh, multi-beam sonar so that we can actually track, you know, where we are and, and we can leap these features uh, as, they, as they come under the boat is absolutely critical for this. Um, these are some typical shots. This is the Gulf Stream pipeline uh, off Tampa here. There's a lot. Uh, this is about three feet uh, in diameter. So you can see that, you know, we can get real close and count all kinds of things, uh, lionfishes and gray snapper, hogfish. And actually, this is the pipeline over here, and that's a green sea turtle actually sitting up underneath the pipeline. Um, uh, this is Sarah's work um, in the Madison Swanson closed area as a as I as I showed you before, this is the one up in the northwest corner. There's a really uh, strong ledge feature in that area along here, and this is where a lot of the fish are. And so 
these circles are basically density counts, so one minute density counts used in the camera system. And you can see that you know, some of these areas have extremely high um, levels of reef fishes, up to 300 you know, per, um, per uh, um, one minute segment, which is I guess about 100 meters. You know, so it's, uh, those, those are high densities, right? Um, one of the issues that we've got, of course, is do these animals avoid um, the, the, do they d d detect the presence of the toad sampling gear and avoid it? And so um, uh, a significant amount of Sarah's work has been looking at um, the uh, degree of reaction of the animals once they enter into the observed field. And so you can see that um, you know, she's classified you know, fish's behavior as, in terms of strong negative, uh, weak negative, strong positive, um, uh, weak positive or neutral behavior. Um, and these are, you know, basically, do they scoot out of the way or are they attracted? In some cases, because we've got these um, green lasers out in the front, they're really attracted to those things. <laughs> and so uh, some of these fish are actually attracted to the laser. It's like the cat following the laser beam, right? <laughs> um, fish are, they don't blink, I'm telling you. They, they just follow us. So you can see that the, our target species are primarily red snapper and uh, snappers and groupers. And you can see that they're sort of weak negative. That is, they enter the field, and if you get really close to them, they kind of shuff, shuffle out of the way. Um, lionfish are oblivious to everything, uh, <laughs> you know, which I guess they haven't any predators yet. So, so this is very encouraging. Um, one of the things that, that we did, and Chad had this idea, was we put this um, Vemco tag detector on, on the sea bass. And we, this is the, um, this is the uh, Madison Swanson area, and this is this strong ledge feature that we worked along. Now, interestingly, um, back in, uh, I think it was 2006, um, Chris Koenig uh, tagged a bunch of uh, snappers and groupers along this ledge feature. Um, with these um, pinging tags that basically have an eight-year life cycle. And we came up with, how many was it, like 28 tags um, from that study uh, of snappers and groupers. And these are the locations of where the tags were actually determined along there. And this is uh, eight years hence. And so what it basically says is, number one, either the tags have fallen out of the fish and are laying on the bottom, which is possible. Or more likely, these animals just don't move around that much, which is really important because if you've got a marine protected area, um, you want to be assure that you know these animals accumulate in the marine protected area and are not fluxing in and out. Right. So, so this is pretty incredible, actually. Uh, you know, far beyond the length of the study. Um, so um, this past year, uh, Noah's really interested in this and, and uh, interested in funding some of this. So uh, instead of understanding behavior just from observing the video that's on board the toad system, came up with this idea to actually uh, put down these camera pods, right? So these are fixed camera pods on the bottom and then fly the, um, the um, sea bass next to it to basically observe a community of fish before the, um, the toad camera comes down the, the lane and then see you know, what they do when they